I'm Wolf Blitzer. Here are some of the stories we're working on for our next hour. He's battling to reclaim the top spot in the Republican race for the White House. Stand by for my live in-depth interview with the uh, former Massachusetts governor, Mitt Romney. That's coming up in the next hour. A Marine bestowed with the prize Medal of Honor ahead. Disturbing military fallout, though, from that deadly firefight that earned him the decoration. And a technology giant with ties to the White House at the center of a growing controversy over a service uh, that could interfere with essential GPS services around the country. You're in the Situation Room. Right now, Republican John Huntsman is in New Hampshire, a state that's certainly critical to his presidential campaign strategy. The former U.S. ambassador to China, the former Utah governor, has his work cut out for him trying to make inroads with voters before the first in the nation primary five months from now. The former ambassador is joining us now live from Manchester. Uh, governor, thanks very much for coming in. Greetings, Wolf. Delighted to be with you from New Hampshire. Good. Uh, let's talk about Social Security first. Uh, if you were president, how would you make sure that our children and grandchildren would continue to get Social Security? Well, I'd, I'd begin with a conversation like I had with a large group of seniors uh, today in Exeter, uh, and that is not to scare them with language that tends to turn off voters, but rather put forward ideas. Uh, like the idea that we can look at the underlying assumptions for inflation and peg it more to the consumer price index, uh, like the idea that we can take Social Security now that we're living three decades longer than somebody born in 1900, uh, and maybe, maybe take it out to the 85th percentile of the average length of life. And third, Wolf, I've got to tell you, there are a whole lot of people in this country beyond a certain income category who probably don't need Social Security. And they would be the first ones to stand up and probably applaud if a politician was courageous enough to say, let's get, let's get the numbers right, let's maybe draw a line in the sand where people really don't need it, they, they can afford to do otherwise, and let's begin fixing the numbers to secure it for future generations. All right, the, the fixes are there. We just don't have the political leadership to move us forward. Well, those are courageous positions you're taking because on the cost of living, for example, in effect, that means less money for retirees, right? That's correct. And on I the issue of me means testing, people pay into Social Security all their lives. If you earn a certain income, you wouldn't necessarily get Social Security. Where would that cutoff point be? Well, we'd have to work out those details, but let me just say I would be willing to have that conversation with the American people. Uh, you, you can find the cutoff, and it would be in the spirit, Wolf, of shared sacrifice. Everyone has to recognize that given uh, entitlements where they are today, given the fact that this economy is sucking wind and that we've hit the wall, we have no choice. People have to stand up and they have to hear the president say that it's going to require a little bit of shared sacrifice. Uh, we haven't uh, started that conversation, but I believe part of it will be exactly what I've outlined in broad strokes here. So from 65 to 67, what age do you think would be a, a good age, not necessarily for the current retirees, but for 10 years down the road, 70? Is that what you want to raise the age well, to? Well, let's just say that we're living longer with each passing year and the benefits of science and health, all a very good thing. Let's just face it to the 85th percentile of the average length of life uh, and use that as kind of a moving scale. I think that would be a good place to start this conversation. Let's talk about another sensitive issue uh, that came up during the debate we all had Monday night in Tampa, the HPV vaccine, the vaccine that in Texas uh, the governor uh, by executive order, Rick Perry uh, mandated that 11 and 12 year old girls get this vaccine to sexually trans to, to deal with a sexually transmitted disease that could lead to cervical cancer. Uh, Michelle Bachman, as you well know, was very critical of him on this. Who is right, Rick Perry or Michelle Bachman? Well, let me just say that whoever comes down uh, against mandates, uh, I think, is on the side of where the American public are. Uh, parents uh, and guardians can make choices. Uh, mandates do not have a role uh, predominantly in these kinds of issues, whether it's health care reform or whether it's what we are discussing here. I think American people, the American people are very skeptical of mandates in society. They want freedom. They want the freedom. They want the freedom to choose these things. Uh, and I think Rick came out uh, courageously and basically said that uh, he had erred and uh, basically uh, uh, took back that earlier decision he made. No, he said he erred in the sense that he, he did it by executive order. He should have gone to the legislature. He went one step further yesterday, uh, and he said this. He said, we should have had an opt-in instead of an opt-out. Uh, are, you, are you with him on the opt-in as opposed to the opt-out? In other words, you would have get that vaccine if parents want the, the little girl to get the vaccine, but you wouldn't get it if the parents don't want you to get it. 
I, th I think the parents uh, ultimately ought to drive that decision. Uh, I think that opt-in is probably right. But I think the broader issue, Wolf, is, uh, you know, we've got to take our dialogue uh, beyond uh, simply the day-to-day -day drama and into the bigger issues that we face, our place in the world, uh, our role in Afghanistan and Iraq, what we're going to do structurally to get this economy back on track. These are the big issues of, of, of the day, and I believe the American people are crying out for a real dialogue and a, and a discussion around well, them. I want to get to those issues in a moment, but one final question on this. Uh, Michelle Bachman, one of your rivals, uh, she says that she spoke to someone, a woman, who told her that uh, her daughter uh, became mentally retarded after getting that HPV vaccine. A lot of scientists, almost everyone, saying that was totally irresponsible, no evidence for that. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you make of that? Well... Uh, if you're going to say something, just check, uh, check your sources, get your information right. If you're going to run for president of the United States, people are pretty much going to uh, want to rely on uh, your facts. They're going to want to rely on what it is you're presenting. Uh, and you darn well better make sure that it's consistent with reality. Is she qualified to be president of the United States? Well, I think she meets the constitutional requirements, of course. The Constitution is one thing, but in terms of her experience, her expertise, her knowledge, is she ready to become commander-in-chief? Well, I would, I would never go beyond what the Constitution requires. Leave that up to the people to decide. They've, uh, they always typically make the best choices. Another sensitive issue, immigration, uh, 12 million illegal immigrants or so here in the United States. In Texas, Governor Perry did uh, support in-state tuition for children of illegal immigrants going to state universities. Are you with him on that? I, I, am with, I am with Rick on that. Uh, I supported the, the same kind of legislation in our state of Utah. Uh, I don't want to punish uh, young kids for the sins of their parents. Uh, in, in many senses, uh, young kids were dragged across a border with no say over their destiny. And I'm not prepared, Wolf, to have a two-tiered bifurcated society. I want to make sure, first and foremost, we fix uh, the, the system whereby we're able to grant citizenship, that is broken, and it's been broken for years. I mean, when I ran an embassy in Southeast Asia 20 years ago, on average it was a year to year and a half to get citizenship. Today it's 12, if you're lucky. So we have a broken system, the reality of 12 million people living in the shadows. We cannot create a bifurcated society, uh, particularly among the young kids. If they earn their way into a local university, uh, I, would, uh, I was willing to say, let's give them the opportunity to succeed. Assuming the border is secure, what would you do uh, for the 12 million illegal immigrants who are in the United States right now as far as a pathway towards citizenship is concerned? Well, I would deal with it humanely and I would deal with it pragmatically. Uh, you can't round people up, you can't wish them away, but I think you can wish away those who are, uh, who are the violent criminals, uh, those who are the drug dealers. I think you can wish them away. The others we need to somehow bring out of the shadows and we have to establish some sort of systematic approach with back taxes. English is our primary language. Uh, whatever fee or penalty or fine has to be paid and we have to begin to make the system work uh, because it is broken. Uh, and it has resulted in a lot of very passionate conversations in our country, dividing people and dividing families at a time where we just need solutions. We need a Department of Homeland Security that can fix the system. And beyond that, we need to remember that immigration and legal immigration has always served this nation extremely well. We're going to need to rely on that again in the future. The infusion of brain power, the infusion of capital, the infusion of energy that we're able to assimilate and have from the very, very beginning, I think is one of our nation's greatest attributes. I want to pinpoint your position on Afghanistan. It's costing the U.S. taxpayers about $2 billion a week to maintain 100,000 troops in Afghanistan, try to develop and secure that country, and it's going to go on for a while. If you were president, what would you do specifically I know you want to withdraw all those, a lot of those forces, but how quickly would you do it? As quickly uh, as as you could do it uh, in a in a safe uh, in a in a in a safe and and systematic fashion, realizing full well that we still have a job to do there, Wolf, and that is collecting intelligence. Uh, that is a special forces need on the ground to take after uh, the terrorists, as we see uh, our our very brave folks do on a daily basis and some element that would be left behind to train the Afghan military. That's not 100,000, that's well south of there. We brought, we've got to bring the rest of them home. We've got to realize that this is an asymmetric threat. This isn't a nation-building exercise. Our nation needs to be built. We need to rebuild our core in this nation, or we are of no value to the rest of the world. So I say let's focus first and foremost on the real threat, 
It's one of uh, an asymmetric nature that requires intelligence and special forces responses. And uh, beyond that, let's begin to review our real national security needs internationally and building around that. And I believe our real national security needs will be first and foremost international economic policy, free trade agreements that will play right back to creating jobs here at home. And second, counterterrorism, where our relationship with, for example, Israel and India, I think, will be extremely important going forward. So just to be precise, you think uh, those 100,000 troops, if you were president today, you could get them out in six months, a year? What are you talking about? Well, as soon as we could do it uh, safely, uh, and as soon as we could do it uh, in a way that would be consistent with the best advice I could get uh, from the generals on the ground, realizing full well that many would be of differing opinions and realizing full well that as president, you're also the commander in chief. You can't always defer to them for all of the decisions. You have to make some of them at the end of the day. But I know the American people, I believe, increasingly feel passionately about this. For 10 years, we have given our all in Afghanistan, and a lot of families have given the ultimate sacrifice, and it's to them that we offer a salute and a heartfelt sense of gratitude. But the time has come after 10 years, Wolf, to restructure our presence in Afghanistan and make sure we're prepared for the future and not the past. One final question, uh, Governor, before I let you go. Uh, look at the polls. Our most recent CNN ORC poll came out before the most recent debate. It had you almost at the bottom down there with Michelle Bachman at 4%, Huntsman 2%, Santorum 2%. Why aren't you resonating with Republican voters nationwide right now? Well, I believe we will resonate uh, with all voters, uh, many independent, a whole lot Republicans, some the old Reagan Democrats. We're just beginning the process of introducing ourselves to the American people. And I know it's slow and arduous. We've been at this uh, uh, a couple of months. When they hear what we have to talk about, they think about it and they say, that's a common sense conversation that this candidate is willing to have with the American people. I think he would serve us well. And above all, he wants to bring this country together because what people feel pains the most, I do believe, is the fact that we are divided in an unprecedented fashion, and there is no need for that. We are Americans, and Americans don't do well divided. It is an unnatural place for us to be. And I'm going to continue to take these messages out to people in New Hampshire. That's where this all begins. And from what I can tell, anecdotal evidence on the street, Wolf, and where we go to meet people, it's catching on. Governor Huntsman, uh, good luck. Thank you, Wolf. I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Governor uh, Huntsman former governor of Utah, the former U.S. ambassador to China. Uh, and stand by for my interview with another Republican contender, Mitt Romney. I'll speak with him live in the next hour. I'll ask him about Rick Perry's political problems and his own political problems. We have viewer questions for him as well that were posted on Facebook. Stand by. And an advocate for the Muslim community is warning FBI training materials are promoting, quote, bigotry of the worst sort. We're investigating.